All right. Well, we're going to have some fun tonight. We have new announcements, so pay attention, because some of you don't know what's going on, and it's immediate, if not sooner. Okay. First of all, Chafer Conference, you know about that. Fall registration open through August 19th, so we know about that. Jeff Phipps is teaching. Pray for him. Three pastors' conferences in Brazil. Men's prayer breakfast, you have August 20th? You know, originally it was August 16th. Where did my other men go? No, it is not. It's 16th is Saturday. I was planning on it this week. I've got the reason. The 16th is a Tuesday. 13th. We were playing with it because I was trying to get speakers. I have speakers. Representative Tom Oliverson, who is representative at Tom Ball and over to Cyprus. He's a Texas State representative. I met him at the um, uh, uh, Christian Legislators uh, Association of National Association of Christian Legislators I went to. Uh, sharp guy, really like him. He's an anesthesiologist, and he's going to come to speak. And we've got uh, ju a, a judge, maybe two, coming to speak. So 8 o'clock, we need to have at least 20 people here. 8 o'clock, Tuesday, I mean Saturday morning, and we'll, this, this coming Saturday, four days, the 13th. Okay, and um, unless everybody's planning on, and we're, everybody's, nobody can make it, then we'll, I'll, I'll talk to them and we'll switch it. Everybody's flexible. So, but we, I just, I've been working for a month to get this set up for either the 13th or the 20th, and I got them all for this week. So that's going to be, be good. And then if you would like to be baptized, I have four people who have uh, said that they, are, um, they desire to be baptized. Right now we're working at a tentative date of either Saturday the 4th of September or Sunday the 5th of September. That's Labor Day weekend. And... Um, so that'll be a good, uh, exciting thing uh, for us to do. And uh, we probably have maybe one or two more who may want to want to be baptized. So that's the announcement. So we've got some uh, interesting things uh, that are coming up. So any other questions on any of the new stuff? Good. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so that we can be spiritually prepared to study the word uh, confess any known sin in silent prayer to the Lord, so make sure we're in fellowship, and uh, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we have you to come to. You are an ever-present help in time of need. And Father, we face so many different crises, some small, some large, every single day, whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it has to do with the uh, situation of the nation, whether it has to do with uh, just uh, situations that come up in our family, raising kids. But we trust in you, we rely upon you, and you are our strength and stay. Father, we pray for this congregation that we might be steadfast. In, in the word, we pray for our nation that you might raise up men, excuse me, men and women who are dedicated, first of all, to you and to your word, and second, to the Constitution, the rule of law in this nation, for without a rule of law, there is no stability. And Father, we pray that you would strengthen our own thinking as we go through uh, these passages, these events that occurred in ancient Israel, because they mirror what is going on in our own nation. And we ask that you guide and direct our thinking tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Last night was certainly 
in my opinion, a terrible night in the history of this nation. It has never happened before where you have a president of one party who has, whether he admits it or not, um, enabled his Justice Department to um, raid the home of a president that he ran against and one whom he may run against in the future. Last night, if you don't know, your head's been in the sand. Um, the Mar-a-Lago home of former President Donald Trump was raided by the FBI. What's interesting is the a lot of anti-Trump people have suddenly switched sides in sympathy to this because it is so egregious. So that it was raided by the FBI, and this raid has angered a lot of Trump supporters and many who were never Trumpers and Democrats. And I thought that we would begin tonight with a video of an interview with Alan Dershowitz, who is a Democrat. He's a Harvard Law professor emeritus. He taught constitutional law. He is no Trump lover. And he addresses these issues from a constitutional and legal aspect. So I'm going to play, uh, play the video. Alan Dershowitz, uh, our resident uh, attorney and expert. We've got uh, this raid. Sir, it's good to have you on uh, at Mar-a-Lago, the FBI at Mar-a-Lago. Um, your your top-line thoughts. We're trying to still piece together what this is exactly about. Unless they can't get the through subpoenas and other lawful methods, the raid is supposed to be a last resort. But this administration has used the weaponization of the justice system against its political enemies. It's arrested people, denied them bail, put them in handcuffs, used all kinds of techniques that are not usually applied to American citizens. And I just hope this raid has a justification. If it doesn't have a justification, the material seized in it will be suppressed. Do you, I mean, I, I, any indications on your end what this is about, or are you, are you just as uh, blindsided as everybody else? I didn't, we didn't see this coming. Well, I suspect it has to do with some uh, investigations leading toward Donald Trump, Donald Trump and some of his uh, associates. But again, the law is clear. You don't engage in a raid unless you've exhausted all the other remedies, unless you believe that the person raided will destroy the evidence. Uh, raids are not a first recourse in America. They're a last recourse. And so uh, the government will have to show a court eventually that they exhausted all other possibilities or they had a reasonable basis for believing that the evidence would be destroyed if it was sought in the normal legal course of events through subpoena. Raids are a last resort, but today, in many instances, it's being used as a first resort. The same yeah. thing is true. With the They're supposed to be last resorts. You write a letter to the lawyer saying, please show up in front of a judge, and that's the way it usually works. But in order to get on television, they have a lot of these raids where people are arrested, put in handcuffs, sometimes put in leg shackles, bail denied. Yeah. Presumption still applies, but it's applied only in theory, but not in practice. Uh, understood. Yeah, President Trump releasing uh, uh, quite a lengthy statement on Truth Social. Uh, here's part of it. After working and cooperating with the relevant government agencies, this unannounced raid on my home was not necessary or appropriate. It is prosecutorial misconduct, the weaponization of the justice system, and an attack by radical left Democrats who desperately don't want me to run for president in 2024. Just wrapping it up, he basically says what you were indicating there, that this is, you know, this is something that was not necessary, that he was cooperating. You said this mm -hmm. should be a last resort. Maybe it wasn't, according to the president. Yes, there is evidence yep. that we're not, this is improper, and it is misconduct. And we have to find out what the facts are, but we have to make sure that the shoe fits on the other foot, that we want to make sure that what's being done here is something that Democrats would not oppose if it were being done to Democratic operatives as well. Yeah. I don't think it passes. Understood, understood. Okay, Alan Dershowitz, thank you, sir, uh, for taking the time. We appreciate it. All right. So... It was amazing this morning when I got up and I was getting ready for, um, I heard this news last night and then I got up today and I was getting ready 
to look at the Judges passage for tonight. And as most of you know, I, uh, I taught Judges 20 year, 22 years ago. That was the last time I taught it, but in the previous 20 years, I taught it about 10 times. So I've been through this book quite a bit. And I knew that we were approaching Judges uh, chapter 9, which is a very important chapter. It's one of three key chapters in the Bible that really give us a, a framework for understanding government and, go and government as in terms of its dangers, the dangers of a tyrannical government. And so I pulled up my lesson from 2020. I have not followed that pattern, uh, those notes at all. I have uh, been taking this as a, as a fresh look at judges as we've gone through it, so they're not the same. There's some good material in the other series that you ought to go back and listen to, and there's similar similarities because it's the same thing. But I was struck by the fact in light of last night that the title of the introduction to Judges 9 was Paganism and Tyranny. How apt that this, this came up at, at this stage. So that's what we're looking at, and here I am taking us into the, um, just a minute, I gotta fix something on my, okay, there we go, on my, on my computer. Paganism and Tyranny, this is a introduction to uh, the Judges 9 intro. So we started off with uh, what Alan Dershowitz says. I think this is so important. Here is a dyed-in-the-wool liberal. He is a strong civil rights advocate, worked, defended cases with the ACLU. He is not a conservative. He is not a lover of Trump at all. And yet he recognizes the legal dangers of what transpired last night. And this isn't the first thing. He mentions many other things that have been done by this administration. And tyranny is not something that you run into that you go from uh, freedom one day to tyranny the next day. Freedom is something that is gradually entered into, and we have been gradually moving that way for many decades because as you grow the federal government, the larger it gets, the more heavy the bureaucracy becomes, the more the government is taking control over people's lives. And when you go back and see how things were in this country 100 years ago, you realize we do not have the freedoms that we had 100 years ago. There's much more government interference and government involvement, involvement in, in all kinds of things. And for those who are probably 60 or 70 years old or older, you've seen a number of different uh, encroachments just in that uh, period of our life. Another statement that came out today was posted on, the, on his Facebook page, and that's uh, Franklin Graham, which I thought was worthy of reading because many of you may not have seen it. He said, 30 years ago, the FBI lost a lot of credibility over the unfortunate events that surrounded Ruby Ridge. Last night, as we watched the events that unfolded at Mar-a-Lago, I couldn't help but think that the FBI and DOJ are losing credibility and the trust of the American people again. I have no idea what was in former President Trump's safe, but if the government thought there was something there that belonged to them, they certainly could have asked for it. What is happening is that politics has entered into the FBI, the DOJ, and even uh, the IRS. Should we be concerned that there are plans to supercharge the IRS and hire 87,000 new agents? Definitely, that's in this horrible bill that, the, that Congress just passed that is going to, supposedly going to control inflation, but in my opinion will just make it make it much worse. 87,000 new agents. That's going to be wep weaponized. This is my opinion. You go back to the um, Obama administration, the, the IRS was used to block applications for 501c3 nonprofits of any nonprofit that had a conservative bent. That's been demonstrated. And that was illegal. And that is the kind of thing that th there's, there's, it's no holds bar no holds barred. And so they're going to be doing this uh, again, going after churches, going after anyone who takes a public position contrary to the one that is politically correct. 
We've seen this kind of thing happening in Canada to our north and as well also in England. Franklin Graham went on to say this is a step in weaponizing the IRS to act against people, organizations, and businesses who have, voice, who have a voice of dissent against government ad agendas. It is an issue of freedom. As Americans, we are losing our freedoms. Our nation has become so corrupt politically and morally. You know, that's a major theme in what I've been teaching for probably the last six weeks in, in Ephesians chapter 4, that we are not to live like the Gentiles, the rest of the Gentiles around us. And that comes down to mor morality and ethics. Now, morality and ethics are not the same as spirituality, but spiritua spiritual principles are not immoral, amoral, or unethical. They are, include ethics and morality. Our nation has become corrupt politically and morally, as did Israel. We need to repent and turn from our sins and call on the name of God, asking for his forgiveness. We need changes in leadership. We need men and women who respect biblical principles and values to run for office at the local, state, and national level. Join me in praying for this country. Ultimately, our hope is not in politicians or leaders, but in Almighty God. Upon hearing what happened last night, Senator Ted Cruz, our senator from Texas, the F said the FBI rating Donald Trump is unprecedented. It is corrupt and an abuse of power. Mike Pompeo, who has been the director of the CIA, he's been... Um, also, he went to West Point. He's uh, has ar had a fantastic Army career. He's been uh, head of the CIA and Secretary of State under President Trump. Said executing a warrant against an ex potus is dangerous. The apparent political weaponization of DOJ and FBI is shameful. The Attorney General must explain why 250 years of practice was upended with this raid. I served on the Benghazi committee where we proved Hillary possessed classified information. We didn't raid her home. Our topic tonight in the introduction is what we learned from this chapter dealing with tyranny. And the first question we should address is just defining terms. It's always important to define terms to find out uh, make sure you, everybody's on the same page when you talk about tyranny. So let's look at the first definition I have here. This is from uh, dictionary.cambridge.org. This is the Cambridge English Dictionary. Uh, tyranny is government by a ruler or a small group of people who have unlimited power over the people in their country or state and use it unfairly or cruelly. Another definition is attributed, is, it's not known who it came from, but tyranny is defined as that which is legal for the government, but illegal for the citizenry. I like that. It's okay for them to do it, but not okay for anybody else to do it. C.S. Lewis, insightful. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. Many on the left end of the spectrum believe that they have what's right. They know better than everybody else. They know exactly what is good for everybody and so forth. On the basis of their ethics, their values, they are going to uh, dictate what the policies should be for this nation. That is not constitutional. That's not the, what made this country a representative republic. And then Russell Kirk, noted conservative from a previous generation. If you haven't read Russell Kirk, you should read Russell Kirk. Not by force of arms are civilizations held together, but by subtle threads of moral and intellectual principle. That is a brilliant and insightful statement. Without morality, John Adams said, this con this, these people cannot govern themselves. The Constitution was made, he said, for a moral people. That's what Russell Kirk is echoing here. 
subtle threads of moral and intellectual principle. When you are operating on the principle that is in the book of Judges, that everyone did what was right in their own eyes, that morality is basically personal and anything goes as long as that's what makes you smile, if that's your ethic, then that will destroy the country. And we are wading neck deep in a pool of moral relativism in this nation. As a result of that, as I pointed out Sunday morning, we'll come back to next time, there are many people who have already written the obituary of our country. There are others who say, no, there is hope, because there are many people who are now waking up. In fact, one headline said that looks like President, uh, President Trump has, uh, is going to win the 2024 election because of this, because all the never-Trumpers have gone over to his side. Well, I don't know about all of them, but I certainly think that there's a sympathy there that was not there before. So a lot of people are awakening to what the leftist policy is in this country, which is to control everybody. So we are in that kind of a situation. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what we see in um, what we see in in Judges 9. And Judges 9 tells us about uh, the um, pathology of the rise of tyranny. So when we come to this section, I'm going to have to skip over the next slide for a minute. I got it out of order. When we skip over and we look at this chapter, we read, we see that this is a turning point in Judges. It's a very important chapter. Remember, it's, this section really started with Judges 6. So we had Judges 6 with the call of Gideon. We had Judges 7, which dealt with the main battle. And then Judges 8, which dealt with the mopping up operation and, and, and the fall of Gideon into, into horrible pride and the nation, leading the nation back into idolatry. And last time we looked at the fact that the core of this was an absolute lack of gratitude toward God. The essence of a, of a national sin that leads to their collapse is ingratitude. Failure to be grateful to God for what we have leads to a collapse of the, na of the nation. So this chapter, chapter 9, is the turning point in Judges. Uh, as I said earlier, along with 1 Samuel 8, they're two of the most significant passages in the Old Testament that teach principles related to government, authority, and the problems of tyranny in government. You will hear some people who will say that government is is evil or government is corrupt. Government is instituted by God. It's the fourth divine institution. So government in principle is divine because God rules, that's government. He governs his creation. But because human government is, is, is populated by corrupt sinners, when there are no checks and balances on the sin natures of those uh, men in government, then yes, indeed, it will exhibit extreme corruption. And we live in a world today in the United States where we have a government that is extremely corrupt. I remember a friend of mine known by several of you here in the congregation uh, who is, no longer lives in Houston, but he told me 25 years ago he said, you, you can't see it right now, but the United States is already a third world country. And we're a third world country because we have adopted the morality and the ethics in government among our leaders that is typical of a third world, uh, a third world country. So when we look at this, these chapters, Judges 9, 1 uh, Samuel 8, uh, we have to recognize that these are foundational chapters, not just for, for Christians, but they were foundational chapters for the founding fathers of the United States. These were chapters that were studied by 
Uh, many of our Puritan forefathers in England in the uh, 17th century, especially in the intense uh, battles between a Puritan parliament and first uh, James I of England and then King Charles I of England and the, the Civil War in, in England and then the rise of the Protectorate under Oliver Cromwell. There was a lot written then. One of the best books on government, which is huge, if you can find it electronically online now, I don't know. It's called Lex Rex by Samuel Rutherford. It was published in the mid-1640s in England, and it's Latin for the law is king. Everyone is under the law. The rule of law is what must we must have if we're going to have any kind of stability and prosperity. It is not rex lex. The king is the law. That was what the, uh, the, the Stuart kings uh, believed in, that the divine right of the king to do whatever he wanted to do, and this is what caused this problem. And so much was written. Uh, during that during that time period leading up to it. Um, one person I'll mention later was Henry Finch. How many of y'all studied Henry Finch? Don't just raise your hand. Uh, that way nobody's going to know that nobody ever heard of him before unless you've paid attention to me one or two or three times that I've talked about him. Sir Henry Finch is known, and I always bring it out in my talks about the history of the prehistory of Zionism because he was basically thrown in prison and lost everything he had because he dared to publish that there would be in the future a return of the Jews to the land of Israel. And, um, and the Messiah would come and rule over all the earth. And James I did not like the fact that there was going to be a king that would be greater than he. What an egotist. So he threw Henry Finch, who was his chancellor of the, I think his chancellor of the exchequer. He was uh, the treasurer, national treasury secretary, as it were, for England. And he wrote a four volumes on the commentaries on the laws of England. It wasn't called that. It had a, a Latin title. Uh, on, the, on the laws of England that was the standard reference book for understanding the laws of England until William Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England came out in the 1750s. That's who Henry Finch was. He was a brilliant man, but he languished his last years in prison and died there because uh, he dared to voice the, his view that Israel was, the Jews were one day going to be restored to their land uh, by God. So that is an example of the kind of tyranny that the British people were under in the 17th century. And so you're the, the godliest people, the close, people closest to biblical truth, we wouldn't agree with a lot of what they said now, um, things moved on, but that's the way it is in history. Uh, but they were probing the scriptures. What do the scriptures teach about government? And they would go to Judges 9 and 1 Samuel 8 and Exodus 20 and several chapters in, Le in uh, Leviticus. And that's what influenced the founding fathers. And you've heard me go through the studies that uh, Professor Donald Lutz at University of Houston did back in the early 80s, demonstrating as, as he got his students to catalog around 5,500 to 6,000 cita citations in the diaries and letters and speeches and uh, other writings of the founding fathers. And when there was a citation of a reference, they listed it, and 33, 34% of the citations came from the Bible. That was their inspiration. Number two was John Locke. John Locke uh, was around 18%. And a lot of the statements that John Locke made were, that were quoted were basically paraphrases of biblical principles. So it was the Bible that was the primary influence on the thinking of many of the um, of the men and women who came to America, the Puritans that came to America from England, later the Scots-Irish in the, um, uh, the mid-1700s, enormous migration of the Scots-Irish came here. They had been drilled on this as their background, and they understood these, these critical principles. 
Unfortunately, today, too often in the pulpits in America, they are populated by people who don't have a clue who the Puritans were, don't have a clue who, um, who, the, who the, um, uh, Samuel Rutherford was. They don't know anything about Henry Finch. They don't know anything about William Blackstone. They don't know anything about uh, what the Founding Fathers read, and they all read the Bible. And many of them, Thomas Jefferson included, and, and uh, George Washington, would get up every day and they would read in either uh, Hebrew or Greek the uh, uh, original uh, New Testament. I don't think Washington knew Hebrew, but I think Jefferson did. They would read in the original. They, uh, Jefferson read his Greek New Testament every single morning in the Greek. These men were educated. They, were they forgot more by the time they were 15 years old than most Americans have learned by the time they're 80. They had a good education system. And so this is um, a problem today is we have churches that are so infected by modernism, they've compromised with evolution, they've compromised with uh, the social sciences of sociology and psychology, uh, they have compromised with uh, liberal do-good principles. They have bought into progressivism, which uh, I always thought progressivism start, started towards the end of the 19th century. And in the last year and a half, I realized, no, the seeds of progressivism were in the early 1800s. And now I'm realizing, no, the seeds of progressivism go back to around the 1740s. And if it weren't, and as I've, I've said this for many years because of my study of history, that if they had delayed another 10 years before they wrote the Constitution, it would never have been written because the opposing view, the progressive view, was not yet strong enough or pervasive enough in the 1780s to exercise any influence on what was written in the Constitution. So we have a culture today in the churches that has led them to be divorced from reality and there is so much untruth, false theology, and psychology and motivational preaching substituting for biblical preaching in our country. And not only that, but in the last few years we've all become aware of the next stage of growth after post-millennialism, which is the critical social justice worldview. And the left is saying anything that was said by the right is, is fake news. Well, by that, they are basically canceling the history of our nation. And this is a problem that was uh, recognized by uh, James Russell Lowell in his poem, The Present Crisis, where he wrote in one of the stanzas in the middle, Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold always the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. That he recognized that wrong dominates. You know, it takes years for the truth to go around the globe, but a lie will travel in a day. And we have so much that people believe is true that is completely false because the, the left and their lies dominate much of the media. Thank God we have the internet. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that just because it's on the internet, it's true, but if you know the correct sources, and that's harder and harder to come by because there's a lot of people on the right who are been seduced by false news and they put stuff out that is that isn't true so this is a major problem that we have now our nation was founded on judeo-christian principles as i said that can not only be traced back to the 1700s and the 1600s but in the history of the english-speaking peoples they can be traced back at least to uh, the uh, saxon king alfred the great and as I pointed out on Sunday, he translated various portions of the Old Testament from Hebrew into English. Exodus 20, several other passages related to law uh, were translated. And he also translated portions of Leviticus and portions of the Psalms, all of the Psalms, 
into the uh, Saxon, into the native language of the people. This was a remarkable thing, and it was found the foundation for English law. And he wrote, uh, wrote out English laws called the Book of Dooms. Dooms was the Saxon word for law. He wrote out the, the law code for England, and that became the foundation for English law. And then if you trace the significance of that, it runs through... Um, it runs through the Plantagenet family and King John and his, his tendency to be a tyrant and run roughshod over the barons of England until they called him to account on the fields of Runnymede where they forced him to sign the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta basically uh, took... Uh, that a lot of the power away from the king, recognizing that the king of England ruled at the behest of the barons. Now that's important because when you get move forward up to the 1700s and you come to the American War for Independence, they recognize that the king ruled at the behest of the leaders of, of, of the colonies. And the co leaders of the colonies uh, were fed up with the illegal activities and the tyranny of the king of uh, king of England, but you go you go back to the Magna Carta and then you move through the uh, 14th century with John Wycliffe translating the Bible into English, uh, for which he was later declared a heretic, and they dug his body up after he died and burned him at the stake. Um, so take that, you heretic. Um, then you have the Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century and 17th century, and there were limitations that are placed upon the power of the king. And you have these battles, as I mentioned earlier, between the Puritan Parliament and uh, Charles I, ultimately leading to regicide and the decapitation of Charles I. And then it was really, I mean, all of this is, is uh, complex, but this was uh, completely erroneous. It fell apart after about 12 years. And then you had the restoration of the monarchy, and there's battles over all kinds of legal issues. And it's during that time that John Locke is growing up. He's reared in a, in a Puritan family, but he understands a lot of the issues related to tyranny. And so his writings are going to be very influential in the 17th century, I mean, excuse me, in the 1700s, on the founding fathers in America, as were the commentaries by William Blackstone. All the founding fathers had read all four volumes of Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England um, before the War for Independence. They were, they were educated. Uh, so you have these people during this time period, great minds who are focused on the rule of law, but where does law derive? Where do we get our law code? Where, does, where are our absolutes? Well, they come from the Bible. They come from God. So there's an eternal uh, reference point uh, there. Also in the 1700s and the 1740s, you had a uh, a revival known as the First Great Awakening, where there were evangelistic meetings held uh, in New England initially under uh, preachers like uh, Jonathan Edwards, evangelists like George Whitfield. Down in Virginia, there was a pastor by the name of Samuel Davies, whose oratory was supposed to be so elegant, but it influenced a young man named Patrick Henry and his congregation. And Patrick Henry learned his oratorical skills from uh, his pastor, Samuel Davies. Uh, so you see the impact of the Bible on the thinking of all of these leaders, but not just in terms of those po political ideas, but the Bible was influential on Adam Smith. Adam Smith wrote a tome like this, The Wealth of Nations, which is uh, the foundational expression of free market e e economics and capitalism. All of this has its roots in the Bible. But by the early 19th century, uh, these insidious attacks against the truth of the Bible began to come out of Germany and, and other places in Europe. And the result of that over a 100-year period is to 
uh, caused people to just throw out the Bible. In the early, early 1800s, you had a German theologian by the name of Friedrich Schleiermacher. He's called the father of Protestant liberalism. And he said, we can't trust the Bible at all. There's nothing there that we can believe, but we have to believe something. We have to believe there's something somewhere out there that gives meaning and purpose in life. So we just have to come to this, this sort of a, a, an emotional experience with whatever this is, and that becomes our benchmark for, for what we know to be true. In other words, he's saying truth comes from emotion. And, and that idea has permeated Western civilization. So people talk about how they feel. How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? And truth is based on feeling. It's not based on fact. It's not based on in, in information. And so you have all of these uh, original ideas that were so very, very important. And what we recognize is that uh, during this time, the souls of the people in America, in Western civilization, were fed uh, by the Word of God. And this is recognized in a great statement by Russell Kirk, who said, if you want to have order in the commonwealth, you first have to have order in the individual soul. Now, when you look at, go back and think about what you saw in Portland and in Seattle and in Wisconsin and in numerous other places around the country and in Minnesota, and you see all of the riots and all of the damage that was done and the continued, continued problems that they have in Portland and in Seattle, and you think, do those people that are attacking the Constitution and attacking our civilization, do they have an ordered soul? Or is their soul filled with chaos? See, their soul is filled with chaos because they have rejected the only thing that will provide meaning and stability in their soul. And if you think about this, if you think about this, that's exactly what is happening in Israel at this time that we're studying. That's why I subtitled this series when chaos was king. Because there's chaos in their soul because there's no, it's not based on anything other than emotion. It's not based on ultimate truth and it's based on everybody, everybody having, uh, having their own truth. And so the point that I'm making is that ideas are important. We have to understand ideas. And I remember when I was in my first year at seminary, I was talking to a, a guy I knew. He'd been a counselor at Camp Pinal, uh, I think, one summer. And he was going to Dallas Bible College. He was about to graduate. I said, what are you going to do next? He's gonna go, he said, I'm going to go to the university. I think it was the University of Texas in Dallas, and I'm going to uh, pursue a master's degree in the history of ideas. I'd never heard of that before. But that is so important because ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have bad consequences. Good ideas have good consequences. Good ideas change things. Bad ideas change things in a destructive direction. Good ideas uh, promote opportunity. They promote blessing. They promote stability. And so we have to be able to distinguish between good ideas and bad ideas. Where do we get the standards to be able to distinguish between good ideas and bad ideas? It has to come from an ultimate reference point that is absolute. And only the Bible gives us that kind of a basis. And so the failure to have uh, those ideas because they rejected God. Remember the language we looked at this in Judges 2. They abandoned God. They betrayed God. They threw out the law. That's what was going on in Israel. It's the same kind of thing that we see today. Rejection and abandonment of God. Rejection of the law of Moses. Turning instead to the worship of the fertility gods who would bring prosperity to the nation through using sex as a means of motivating the gods to bless them was the essence of the fertility religions in the ancient world. It is paganism that destroyed the stability and the order of Israel. And paganism always deteriorates into tyranny. First, paganism deteriorates into the chaos of antinomianism. 
and everybody does what's right in their own eyes, and it creates chaos, but you can't live in a chaotic world. So what do you have to do? You have to have some strong authority come in and control everything, bring it back under control in order to provide order and stability. And that's tyranny. This is exactly what Hitler did after the uh, uh, after just the, the collapse and the moral relativism and the craziness that went on during the Weimar Republic in Germany during um, the 1920s. I mean, if you watch the musical film Cabaret, you get a sense of that because that's what it's describing is what was going on in, in Berlin. And you had all of the homosexuality and the gender confusion and all of these other things uh, going on in Germany. And, and, and the uh, inflation got so out of hand that people would have to take a wheelbarrow of Do Deutsche Marks uh, to the marketplace to buy a loaf of bread. And that's where we're headed with the kind of out of control spending of the federal government. That's what causes inflation, is when they print more, more and more money. And people were, you know, all of us were given money by the government. They just printed it, just turned up the printing machine, just put another decimal point out there on the computers and printed all this money, as it were, and get, sent everybody $1,000 here and $1,000 there and another $1,000 the next year to get us through COVID. And uh, the result of that was it, it developed inflation. It started under President Trump. That never should have happened because that destroys the value of money. The more you print, the less the dollars are worth. And so we have this increase of uh, inflation. That's what happened in the Weimar Republic. And so what happened? Everything became chaotic, society, culture, law, everything broke down, and you get this strong man, Adolf Hitler, that comes in, and uh, he's able to take control, and then you have real tyranny. And it led to the, what, the destruction, the defeat, the jail, jailing, the torture, and the imprisonment and execution of anyone who uh, disobeyed him, anyone who violated his sense of right and wrong. So paganism always leads to tyranny. It is only the Bible that gives us a basis uh, for freedom and truth. So let's look at a definition of, of paganism. Uh, this comes out of the American Heritage Dictionary, and it defines, gives four, different, four definitions of pagan. A lot of people hear when I use the word pagan that it's some sort of insult, some kind of pejorative term. But it's not. It's a technical term. Uh, its first and primary meaning, it, it refers to someone who is not a Christian. Now, you'll read in some dictionaries, like the American Heritage Dictionary, that, that the three monotheistic religions, uh, for them, that's Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, they are not pagan by definition. I radically disagree. In fact, sometime in the last three months, I made this statement, and somebody who tuned in to the live stream or listened to a lesson for the very first time heard that, and it was a Muslim background believer, and sent us an email and said, I just thank God that you understand that Islam is not a monotheistic religion and that it is evil and it is pagan. And, and they went on to say they were just tired of, of uh, Muslims always being classified as, as along with Christians and Jews. They're, they're not. Jews have the Old Testament. They have the same basic foundation that we have as Christians. And that doesn't mean every Jew is that way because most Jews in America are so secular and liberal that they would, uh, and I'm quoting a book by um, Zev Kafetz, called A Match Made in Heaven, Why Israel Needs the Support of American Evangelicals. And he has three chapters on politics, and they are very insightful. He has one chapter called uh, Jews are Liberal, Israelis are Conservative. And in there he says that 40% of American Jews are so committed to liberal leftist policies. I mean, he wrote this book almost 20 years ago now. And he said 40% uh, uh, of, uh, of, of the Jews in America are so liberal that if, that if they would knowingly vote for a president 
whose election would lead to the destruction of the state of Israel in order to preserve the right to abortion. Now just think about that. Their leftist God is more important to them than the existence of the state of Israel. And that's, that's an alarming reality, but that's true. Liberalism, leftism, is a religious position, whether they want to admit it or not. So you have Christianity and biblical Judaism are, uh, are not pagan. Everything else is pagan. It, that's what it refers to. It refers to a non-Christian religious pos position. So it is also used to refer to someone who has no religion, uh, sometimes it's actually used for those who are more into the occult and into witchcraft and things of that nature, Gnosticism, New Age movement. Uh, and it refers, that, that would be closer to the fourth category, a hedonist, somebody who just lives life for personal, personal pleasure. Paganism is, has many manifestations as a worldview. And I've been talking a lot the last uh, several, last month or more on wor what worldliness is. And James 3, 13 through 15 defines this, primarily verse 15. This wisdom, that is the wisdom that is mentioned in verse 14. Those who have bitter envy and self-seeking in their hearts. Those who are self-absorbed. Those who are bitter about the fact that, and they're angry against God because... Uh, something has happened in their life. They lost their job. They lost their parents. They lost a loved one, some horrible situation. And so they blame God and they're mad at him and then they become an atheist. And I liked, um, I can't remember the name of the, the, uh, the film right now, documentary, uh, kind of an, a docudrama uh, that was done about an atheist professor. And finally, there, there are arguments, uh, it came out, he was so mad at God because of something that had happened to his parents. And so the Christian said, well, how can you ma be mad at something, someone that doesn't exist? So that was a very, very good point. But this wisdom, this human viewpoint, pagan wisdom, doesn't come from above. It doesn't come from God, but it's earthly. That means it has its source in uh, human beings. Remember, in Revelation, it refers to the unbelievers during the tribulation as the earth dwellers. So this is talking about all the belief systems that are contrary to the Bible. It is earthly. Second, it is soulish. It's translated uh, sensual, but it's the Greek word sukikos. Suke means soul, so it's soulish. They're not regenerate. They don't have a human spirit. Uh, and the demonic. So human viewpoint thinking is, is the thinking of the unbeliever. It's the thinking of the unbelieving Gentile. It's the thinking of demons. It's the thinking of Satan. That's what all of these views are. So this is what we've seen in Judges. It's all about how a nation that has been uh, given so, much, so many blessings by God, they've been redeemed from slavery in Egypt, they've been miraculously taken care of for 40 years in the wilderness, and now they're coming into the land uh, that God has promised them. And within a period of about 300 years, they go from being a nation that is spiritually victorious and blessed by God to a nation that is worse than the Canaanite nations that they were sent to destroy. And that's what's happened to the United States. Um, this nation has become a laughingstock to many people in this country because of the leadership that we have. I, I listened to a collage of statements that was made recorded from a speech by our president that made no sense as he stumbled around and patched together this phrase and that phrase and this other phrase over a period of about 75 seconds that just made you cringe because it had no meaning. And that was followed up with uh, L L Little Miss um, Word Salad herself, our vice president, Kamala Harris. And you listen to many things that she says, they don't, they don't mean anything. You know, I've been working on a little skit to try to uh, do an impression of her, and it's not hard. 
You just don't say anything. You just keep repeating things. You say nothing. You just say, that's what it's all about, is saying nothing, and that's what I'm communicating. It's nothing. And, and then you have Nancy Pelosi, and it, it's just gibberish. It's not even, you can't even pick out what the words are supposed to be. And we've elected these people to office. And I know that, that when, you know, this was kind of a joke that went around is that, well, if you go anywhere in the world and you say, well, you know, the idiot, everybody knows you're talking about President Biden. So I tried it out when I was in Ukraine the last two years. Everybody knew who I was talking about. It's true. You go anywhere in the world, they know that we are led by a pack of idiots. And that's what happened to Israel. We're following that same pattern. And, and for us who've seen some of the greatness of this country when we were younger, it is a heartbreaking. It is sad. And it's discouraging. And we don't like it. We want to hear more upbeat things. But we live in this world. We're not to be, be conformed to this world. And we are to be lights of revelation. Light is always used in Scripture in relation to revealing truth representatives of God because God is light. And so we are to be representatives of truth, representatives of God, ambassadors for Jesus Christ to a wicked and perverse generation. That's coming up in Philippians chapter 2. That's what we're supposed to be. And, and we aren't supposed to just huddle up in our houses and, and watch all the, let the wickedness and the perversion go by. But we are to be out there engaged like the Apostle Paul was. We have to be educated. We have to be trained. We have to be taught. That's one of the reasons that I'm hoping we'll have a lot of people go to the uh, state fair uh, down, or the county fair down in Fort Bend County with the training for evangelism, how to uh, give the gospel to unbelievers to become, the more you do it, the more comfortable you will become doing it. And a lot of Christians just, you know, I just feel so uncomfortable. Well, we are commanded by the Lord to take the gospel, be able to articulate it. And that means that, that you're going to make a lot of mistakes. We all do in learning anything. I forget what the specific st statistics are, but Babe Ruth had the, has the great record for how many home runs, are, but he also has a record for, for the most strikeouts, I think, because you, we make mistakes in the path of learning. And so I encourage you to go to this and to, uh, to learn it. It's really interesting and fun and educational to listen to some of these guys who have the gift of evangelism, and they go do this day in and day out at fairs all over the country. And it's important to learn that. So what we've seen here in Judges is this deterioration that takes place. Uh, from the first judge, you go through Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, and we've come through Gideon, and now his son. See, we're over halfway down the slide. And Abimelech, you just read through this, and it just, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time there because it's like wallowing in the bottom of a cesspool. And then Jephthah comes along, and then Samson, who, about whom nothing good is going to be said. And we just see this. But God is gracious. And you would think that Israel would just self-implode, but no, what happens? God gives them a king. He gives them a, a, a pretty bad king initially, Saul. He was good at first and got worse, but then they have King David. So their, their golden age is in the future. It's not in the past. It wasn't under Joshua. It's going to be in the future under David and again in the future under the Messiah. So we see the cycle that goes on here. Disobedience to God leads to divine discipline, and that in turn leads to God delivering them. They don't always cry out for deliver. They cry out for deliverance, but they don't repent. They don't turn back to God like under this in this Gideon cycle. They just cry out to God in the misery of their circumstances, their self-induced misery. And God, in his grace, gives them Gideon. But by the time Gideon dies, he's led him back into idolatry. And the end is worse than the beginning. So we see in Judges 17, 6, 18, 1, and 19, 1, that this book was written at a later time when they had a king. When they had a king who was ruling to some degree, um, we don't know exactly when it was written, but where there was stability and chaos did not rule. 
Judges 17, 6, the writer says, in those days, so that tells us that he's sometime in the future. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. In Judges 18, 1, again, it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And in Judges 19, 1, now, it came about in those days when there was no king in Israel. Now, the, the, th that has a double meaning. Because the true king of Israel, according to the Mosaic law, was God. And God was the ruler over Israel. And human leaders just had a delegated authority or an authority delegated to them. And they were rejecting, this was a time when not only did they not have a human king, but they had rejected God as king of the theocracy. And so everyone was just doing what was right in their own eyes. So the book of Judges is an argument as to why a human king was necessary in Israel. God had previously been Israel's king and is rejected in, in, in 1 Samuel 8, verse 7. Uh, the book of Judges is one of the key books in the Bible for the purpose of laying the foundation for a Christian philosophy of politics, government, society, and the impact of a nation's spiritual, spirituality on its culture. We are to be transformative. What is happening is the culture is transforming most churches into something that is pathetic. So this leads us to what I, the, about six points I was going to start with tonight. We'll come back and start with them next week on what tyranny is. And, um, but the opposite of tyranny is freedom, individual freedom. And we have to understand what those principles are before we get into this particular chapter. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to be reminded that even though things look dark on the outside, things have looked dark in many different countries, in many different ways, in many different centuries throughout the history of the human race. They looked extremely dark many, many times during the history of this of a period of the judges. And it, it's a perfect illustration that when man seeks to be the center of his universe and the definer of reality, that he destroys himself. And we are so saddened by what is going on in this nation, what is taking place in, in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York and places like Boston and Portland and uh, places like uh, Seattle and, and even in Houston and Chicago. And we have so many who want to rule on the basis of arbitrary rules and those who wish to uh, just uh, allow uh, criminals to go free. And Father, we can't survive like this. And we just pray that you would raise up a godly men and women who understand reality as it is, as you created it in this coming election, uh, and that we can have a, a tremendous uh, response of voters and that you will limit corruption, expose corruption, and uh, allow us the opportunity to, uh, to be restored because there are so many in this nation who are believers who seek to, to honor you and glorify you and they do not go along with what these policies are that are being imposed upon us by these pagans in government. And Father, we pray that if you do not change things, that we might still have our peace, our happiness, our joy, and that we may shine as lights in the, wicked, in the midst of this wicked and perverse generation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.